All right, good morning, everybody. Everybody ready? Good morning. Uh, we are uh, very proud to host uh, Governor Lamont uh, here at Hartford City Hall this morning. Governor, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are uh, in the function room here at Hartford City Hall and uh, uh, grateful for the chance to uh, recognize this important bill signing uh, with you and to spread the word about how important and easy it is to vote because of the changes that have been enacted on a bipartisan basis in the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, in the last two federal elections, one in four Americans has voted by mail. And since 2000, 250 million votes have been cast by mail. There are a number of states that use mail-in voting as their primary form of voting. I think it's important to say all that because in many ways, Connecticut has been behind the curve when it comes to no excuse absentee balloting or mail-in voting, early voting, things that a number of other states have done more aggressively than we have. But this year, in the face of an unprecedented pandemic, the governor and legislators on a bipartisan basis uh, have taken responsible action to make sure that every Connecticut resident has the ability to vote as easily and as safely as possible. There were important changes enacted in July and important changes just enacted in this special session that make it a little bit easier for our clerk's offices to uh, count those votes, to count them in a, a more timely way. And I am deeply grateful to the governor for his leadership and to legislators, again, of both parties, for recognizing the importance of making voting easy, accessible, and safe to every Connecticut resident. I also think it's important to say that those who have attempted to sow distrust or create fear about mail-in voting are not making arguments based in fact. There have been countless examinations of mail-in voting. The Brennan Center has looked closely at it and has found that levels of voter fraud across U.S. elections are infinitesimally small. Voting by mail is secure, it is safe, the ballots are protected. Every American who cares about our democracy should want to make it as easy and as safe as possible for every American to cast their vote. And anybody who attempts to equate mail-in voting with voter fraud is simply trying to delegitimize our electoral process in advance. No American who cares about our democracy should, should accept that. Every American who cares about our democracy should denounce that. This is a simple and easy issue. Many states have allowed extensive mail-in voting for a long time. There is an infinitesimally small amount of irregularity in that voting process. The strength of our democracy depends on as many people voting as possible. That's important always, in every year and in every election, and it's even more important now because as we learned in yet another way this morning, the coronavirus is still here, it is real, it is dangerous, no one is immune to it. And so the actions that the governor and the legislature together took to make sure that any American, any Connecticut resident who wants to drop their mail, their, their ballot in a drop box or send it in can do that so that they can help keep themselves and their family fit safe is that much more important right now. Finally, just a quick things on uh, uh, some of the mechanics of this. One of the reasons that the bill that was passed with the governor's leadership in this special session is so important is because we will be do dealing with uh, an unusually large number of mail-in ballots. Today, our clerk's office will be sending out about 5,000 ballots. Uh, that's a larger number, a significantly larger number than usual, but they have also staffed up 
in preparation for managing that process safely, securely, and efficiently. There are drop boxes around the city in multiple locations, here at City Hall, at Albany and Woodland, at Park and New Park, and on Maple Avenue, where you can drop your ballot. Our team is ready to process those, and because of the changes that were made in this special session, they'll have the ability to do that a little bit more effectively and efficiently. But we should expect, set expectations now that given the increased number of absentee ballots or mail-in ballots that uh, the team will be processing, we may not get results quite as fast as we normally do. But that's a pretty small trade-off to allow every Connecticut resident the ability to vote safely, securely, conveniently in this election and every election. So, Governor, thank you for your leadership. Thank you to all the legislative leaders. I want to acknowledge uh, here today our registrar of voters, uh, Giselle Feliciano, and our town uh, clerk, our city clerk, Noel McGregor, uh, as well as their teams. Uh, and, uh, and I want to uh, now turn this over to uh, Anna Posniak, who is representing the Connecticut uh, Clerks Association. Anna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Mayor. Governor, thank you. Um, this is an unprecedented, unprecedented election during an un unprecedented year. The town clerks are appreciative of the governor's and the General Assembly's efforts to provide us with an opportunity to open the outer envelope, which will help us to process the absentee ballots on election day securely and more quickly. Um, thank you again for your, your efforts to help with this election process. Any voter that wants to go to the polls, the polls are open and safe, but we do encourage every voter to have a backup plan this year. If you want to apply for an absentee ballot, please contact your local city or town clerk and they will provide you with an absentee ballot. That ballot will not be counted unless you turn that ballot into the town clerk on election day. That way, if you find yourself prior to the election quarantined or sick, you have an option to vote safely and securely. Please vote this year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Anna and Luke. Um, first of all, uh, on a personal note, um, the President and the First Lady had tested positive for COVID, and our, our thoughts and prayers go out to the Trump family. And in terms of a Connecticut connection, um, Hope Hicks, who also tested positive. Uh, all the best to her and her family. I was on the board of Selectmen many years ago in Greenwich, and Paul Hicks, Hope's dad, was my fellow select person. So it just reminds you that uh, we want to continue to err on the side of caution. And, uh, and this is a tough time. You know, October, November, colleges coming back, flu season, and voting. And I really salute what the legislature has done over the last few days and ready to sign this bill that allows Connecticut residents to vote safely. No long curling lines like in Wisconsin or Georgia. And uh, if you're of a certain age, probably better to um, use absentee ballot. As, uh, as Mayor Bronin said, um, I appreciate two things. Uh, absentee balloting has become a bit of a partisan issue uh, in Washington and um, in other parts of the country. I, I see that the uh, governor of Texas just tried to limit the number of um, boxes where you can drop the uh, ballots remotely. And that's not true here in Connecticut. Um, as Luke said, we have multiple um, places you can drop the um, ballot right here at City Hall and other places. We have 168 other towns right at Town Hall where you can uh, drop off your ballot as you see fit. And I really appreciate that here in Connecticut, um, making it easier to vote safely and honestly uh, has been a bipartisan effort, and uh, that makes a big difference. And as Anna said, uh, what we've done in terms of um, ballot applications are all out. Now we're beginning to send out uh, the ballots themselves. We want you to be able to um, cast your vote um, and cast your vote uh, in early October soon. 
I don't want any delays. Uh, I want to make sure that Anna and her team were able to start um, processing those the Friday before uh, Election Day and at 6 a.m. that morning start being able to count the votes. So there's no room for um, anybody casting shade about the integrity of our process here in Connecticut. And as Luke said, there's no reason to cast any shade about the integrity of our process across the United States of America. We have had a uh, successful transfer of power, if that's what happens uh, in this country, uh, going back uh, 240 years. And we're going to be able to do that again. We're going to do that, be able to allow you to vote safely and allow you to make sure that we do this on an accurate basis and on a timely basis. So, Anna, you're going to be very busy for the next uh, 30 days. We appreciate your efforts. We also appreciate, Anna, the efforts of uh, all of our universities, or certainly almost all of them, who are providing uh, volunteers, uh, election day and earlier. And we have a website set up where, um, and if you or any of the clerks need help, need help in terms of um, you know, watch, poll watchers, need help in terms of helping the process, uh, we've got the volunteers there. And I know the Secretary of State, Denise Merrill, has also provided funding for our um, clerks and registrars to get you additional support to make sure that what's going to be an incredibly busy election day on November 3rd, with 10 times more absentee ballots than we've ever been through before, Connecticut gets ready. We're going to get those votes cast. We're going to do it safely. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions first or do you sign it? Let's do a question first. We're standing here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Governor, has the, the diagnosis of COVID with the president, has that caused any changes and any precautions you take? And also, can you just generally talk about what your practice has been uh, about limiting exposure and whatever testing you have? Yeah, I think it was a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for a lot of people who are beginning to get very casual about COVID and, um, and wearing the mask. Uh, I've been getting tested regularly uh, every two to three weeks for some months now. My staff is going to get tested uh, more regularly uh, than they have in the past. Um, Susan and I will continue to um, you know, try and do events separately wherever possible, especially if they're indoors. Uh, you know, thankfully, uh, Vice President Pence tested, uh, tested negative, and he's in good shape. On the, the topic here, uh, during the debate, we heard from at least uh, Senator Sampson, there was an exchange with him and, and Senator Haskell, over sort of the integrity of uh, the election and the uh, mass mailing of absentee ballots. Uh, either to you, and I'd be interested to, to hear what uh, Anna has to say. Uh, what's your sense, and the mayor as well, uh, What's your sense of the security of these absentee ballots? I think here in Connecticut and across the country, look, we've been uh, casting votes absentee in uh, states across the country, red states and blue states, uh, and done that very successfully with a great deal of integrity. And by the way, you know, I remember hanging chads back in Florida uh, some 20 years ago. So. Um, uh, there's risks on both sides. I think Connecticut is doing it right, and I think America is doing it right. And uh, I really think it's important for our, uh, public leaders to um, give people confidence in the integrity of a process that deserves that confidence. But Anna, would you like to add to that? Or... Lou? I think one thing we need to point out is that a, there's not a mass mailing of absentee ballots. There was a, there was a mass mailing of applications. It's a two-part process. You still need to request an absentee ballot. And the town clerks will go into the system. We, will make, we are certain that we are only issuing one ballot per voter. And when the ballot come back, we then also go into the system and process them. And every person who submits their absentee ballot in advance of the election will have an A next to their name, preventing them from voting at the polls. On the day of the election, we will not turn over any absentee ballot to be counted until we can safely and securely ensure that that person did not vote at the polls. This will add to a little bit of time in the evening because when the poll books come back to us, we will go through them and be certain that no one voted at the polls. If they voted at the polls, we will reject their absentee ballots 
and they will not be given a second time to vote in the election. Does that mean that you can't begin counting at 6 in the morning if you're going to wait to 8 o'clock at night to make sure that person? No. Okay. So prior to the election, the town clerks turn over every absentee ballot to the registrar voters. They will put an A next to that person's name on the official checklist that goes to the polls on election day. That day at 6 o'clock in the morning, they can begin counting all ballots that have been accounted for with the registrar of voters. So it's only the day of the election, the ballots that we receive that day, that we have to go to the polls and make sure that they didn't vote at the polls. I see, because that, that, that card wired to the list is different. Yes. Can you just very quickly um, run through what it is you need to do to process these? You know, I, mean, I think to most people, it's like you open an envelope and you put it in the machine. But can you just quickly re review for us what you actually do when these come in? Certainly. So when the ballots are returned back to us, we have to um, date stamp every single one of them with the precise date and time that we receive them. It receives the town clerk's signature. And from there, we go into the state voter registry system. We process the, the ballot um, as received. That will also update the voter list with an A next to it. From there, we have to file the absentee ballots in district order, then street order, then house number, and then by the voter's name. That's to assist the registrar of voters when we turn over the absentee ballots so that they're in the exact order so they can go through the checklist. At that time, we securely um, put all of the ballots in our vaults where they're maintained without any public access. And then it's on the day of the election that we turn those over to the registrar voters with an affidavit process. I will indicate every single absentee ballot per district. First thing the registrars will do is count those absentee ballots to make sure that it matches what I have on the affidavit. At that point, we turn them over and then they began opening the absentee ballots. So what this legislation allows for is only the opening of the first envelope and not opening the second envelope. So on the morning of the election, they will then open up that second envelope and then take out the ballots. And we do this very um, securely. We do this while maintaining the person's privacy while voting as well. And then they're put into the tabulators where they'll be counted on election day. close on election day? Yes. Uh, voters in the state of Connecticut can return absentee ballots up till 8 o'clock on election day. What about the challenges? Just see if I can follow up. What about challenges? Are the parties going to be sending more people out to, to watch these absentee ballots than the normal? I mean, have you gotten any indication? Uh, about that, what's what's the what's the pr procedure? What are the rules for people who, who are, are observing the, the counting of the absentee ballots or the process of the absentee ballots? So anyone can request an uh, an absentee uh, list of those who requested absentee uh, ballots. We do turn those over to parties, and then on the day of the election, the opening of the absentee ballots is public, and the public can watch it. Um, this year, though, during uh, due to the pandemic. Um, you know, there might be a limited amount of people that can be allowed in because the rooms are very small and we do need to have uh, a quite a few uh, people processing the absentee ballot applications and we need to be able to maintain social distancing measures for those people. So um, if anyone does want to watch this, please contact the registrar of voters in advance to see what your ability is to be in the room. Just, just real quick to the previous question. I, I think it's really important to, to start with the recognition that absentee balloting is not new. Absentee balloting has been a feature of our democratic process in this country for years. And again, in the last two federal elections, one in four Americans has voted by absentee ballot. And so uh, though anybody who is uh, making the argument that absentee balloting increases voter fraud is spreading a fiction. And it is not an innocent fiction. It is a fiction designed to sow distrust and to call into question the legitimacy of our election. And it's not acceptable. 
And that argument is being led by the President of the United States and unfortunately followed on a, pipe, on a partisan basis across this country. We need to reject that. This is about safe, secure, accessible voting for every American. Anyone who cares about American democracy should embrace that. Nation. Connecticut residents woke up this morning as more of a nervous nation than they did the previous day, given the COVID positive test for POTUS. So what do you say to residents? You know, the weather's getting colder. We're holding more of these indoor events. Teachers are back at school. How do you, what do you want to say to the residents to sort of ease their fears? I think that um, the infection of uh, the president and first lady is just a reminder that we're not out of the woods. It's a reminder how cautious we've got to continue to be. It's a reminder that October and November are going to be incredibly important months. If we can maintain the mask, maintain the caution, maintain the distancing, uh, I think we'll be able to do this safely. I think uh, we'll be able to continue to have our kids go to school. We're overwhelmingly been able to do that safely. Uh, but I think this is no time for us to lower our guard. I think that's what the reminder is. Maybe as a baby. <laughs> cases in the northeastern part of the state it seems to be becoming more of a hot spot. Uh, is there anything else you can say about it? Any additional steps that, that you plan to take? Well, um, certainly in southeast Connecticut, um, you know, Norwich we uh, know about, even some other related to nursing homes. One of the nursing homes, Norwich, you know, got a little bit of community spread there. Uh, one of the things we're doing is I've been in contact with, with the uh, casinos. They're going to. We have thousands of casino workers who live in Norwich, as, you, as many people know, and they're uh, aggressively doing the testing right now, making sure that all their employees are tested, making sure that uh, they quarantine if anything happens, testing their families as well. Uh, we brought out our, our rapid deployment force to Norwich just the other uh, day, and they're uh, doing. Uh, free testing everywhere, track and trace, providing additional support, doing what we can to make sure we contain the virus and don't let it spread. Yeah, can you speak more on if there's a potential kickback from the tabulators on the absentee ballots, so what the process looks like as far as addressing something like that on election day? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Sure. Um, on election day, when you begin to process the absentee ballots, if there's any sort of a, a issue with the tabulators or kickback on the ballot. What's the process in addressing those potential errors? So the tabulators that we have um, are, we insert the ballots in and there's a certain timing that um, with putting them in to be certain that the, tab the tabulator reads the ballot before you put the next ballot in. Any sort of notification to the, the voter if there is an error on their ballot? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. If that's okay, mask or hurting. <laughs> Any sort of notification to the voter if there is an error on their ballot? Is yes, there... the uh, tabulators are programmed that if the person overvotes, that it will uh, spit the ballot back out, and then the election worker can inform the voter that they overvoted. And they will be given a second ballot, um, and the first ballot will be rejected, and they'll give a second ballot so that they can vote um, correctly. Yeah, of, of poll watchers, I think there might be some confusion amongst the, the general public about what, what does that term mean, a poll watcher, and it seems to have become a sort of politically loaded term uh, came up in the, in the debate the other night. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, unfortunately, I can't speak to that. That would be the registrar of voters that handle the poll watchers. Sorry. As far as I know that you extended the rent, the eviction moratorium uh, the other day, and I wanted to know if uh, you've been able to talk to your administration or figure out how many people have received rental assistance so far? Not enough. Uh, as you know, it's not a matter of handing out the money, it's a matter of doing the negotiation. Um, Department of Housing has expedited um, the ability to get your information there, what your salary is, um, and the such. And uh, we've got a, a w new group of counselors. So we're going to be able to catch up, I think, in the month of October for virtually everybody who needs that support. That's on the landlord and the tenant side. Okay, let's just one more question, then we can get to the side, I guess. Um, what's your, what is the expectation of uh, the rejection rate? Usually it seems to be it's, it's been about 2% in the last, 
I think four yeah. state election cycles. I, I don't know about the, the, the municipal cycles. So, uh, you know, even if it is one or two percent, it, it's still going to be a lot of ballots. So, what, what, do you, what, do you, what is the expectation from the clerks? Um, we are uncertain what the number of rejections would be with this election, but I can assure you that the Secretary of the State and the town clerks have been doing. Uh, PSAs and uh, trying to educate our voters because we understand that there are many first time absentee voters to explain that it is a two envelope system. The inner envelope must have your name and your date uh, that you're signing it. And then that is enclosed in the outer envelope. Missing um, signing your name is probably the highest reason for rejection. So we are constantly educating our voters that they need to sign that inner envelope. You said your staff is going to be tested more, so there hasn't been any kind of formal regimen, but is that correct? That is correct, okay. yes. And are you going to have, I mean, is, is this going to be a uh, systematic thing, or is it just going to be a suggestion that people get tested? No, I think we should do it on a systematic basis. There's a group of people that I meet with all the time, uh, and by the way, uh, the president's staff, they're tested uh, on a daily basis. And that reminds you, testing is not foolproof. There are leaks in that system, especially if you're, um, uh, you're a carrier, you may not be symptomatic at that point, and the test may miss that. Have there been any positive cases among your staff? No, not that I know of. Let's sign the bill. Thank you, everybody.